Hey everyone, thanks for joining us today. We're here at May Steel's Allenton, Wisconsin headquarters. I'm Lindsay Ojeda, I'm the marketing manager here at May Steel, and I'm joined today with Andrew Smith. Hey Andy, how are you? Hey Lindsay. He's our design engineering manager and he has over 12 years of manufacturing experience. I'm also joined by our special guest, a recent May Steel alumni, Bob Kinsey, who has over 47 years of sheet metal experience. Hey Bob. Good morning, Lindsay. How are you? Very good. Good. So we love to go on site. We love to collaborate with our customers and that's difficult right now. So we said, hey, let's go virtual. So bear with us. This is our first live virtual experience, but we wanted to talk about the things our customers have questions about. And one thing we get quite a bit is how do I speed up production on my sheet metal enclosure or kiosk or cabinet? And how do I reduce costs? So I'm gonna leave this to the experts. How do we do that guys? By using our established DFM techniques or design for ease of manufacture techniques. Let me give you an example. Here we have a small fan enclosure consisting of 13 different pieces to make it. By using these established techniques, we have the same enclosure which now consists of six different pieces. Lower cost, ease of manufacture, able to handle the ramp properly if you need to have a quick turn up, get a lot of parts, we can do that, and less quality issues as well. Awesome. So Bob actually collaborated with us on a recent blog. I love to use our in-house experts because I'm not an engineer. They, they definitely are. And one thing that we went through are seven actionable items that our customers can take to reduce costs and speed of productivity. So we're going to go step by step. Don't worry, there's time for notes. You can leave questions in the comments. So the first one that we have is don't overload your enclosure with fasteners or hardware. Can you guys speak to that? Yeah, definitely. Um, so one of the things that comes across is it, just general knowledge as far as what you can and can't do with sheet metal. Um, a lot of areas as far as trying to fasten on support brackets or mounting things, thing, within your enclosure, that, that comes up almost in every assembly we see. Um, what we see a lot of when we, when we talk when we're talking through upfront designs is just a nut and bolt type of design. It works, but it's extra hardware, it's extra side of hands to hold things. Sometimes you don't always have the access to get the tools in there to hold that. What we look at and things that we try to implement and work with our customers is different form features that you can work into the parts, things like extruded holes or pressed in hardware, or maybe perhaps redesign a joint so that it locks into itself rather than trying to count on a nut and bolt to hold it together. I've got a great example here of a fan guard that um, the original design was actually a rivet with a washer to hold the actual guard on uh, by implementing some of these design for manufacturing caper, uh, techniques, if you will, that Bob touched on. We actually broke it down to make it all in one form feature. Um, as you can kind of see here, this, this is the original design. So you can see there's a washer on the back side and your rivet goes to the front. So we lost you there a second, Andy. Can you pull that back and, and tell us what we were looking at there? Yeah, so the original design that we received from the customer, we have a riveted design where it rivets through the sheet metal, goes through the fan guard, and then holds on with the washer. Awesome, got it? By working with the customer, we actually came up with a form feature we can implement into the part that holds that guard in place. Um, eliminates the extra assembly step of putting the rivet in. It also makes it a lot easier as far as automating that design because in this particular assembly, you have three of these fan guards that go all the way across. So there's 12 holes total that go into this part. That's 12 rivets and 12 washers. We've actually brought that in as an extruded hole that does the same thing with no hardware at all. Awesome, and everyone can see where Andy's pointing to right there and the difference between the two. That's a great example. It's nice that they can actually see the difference between before and after. Number two, I like, I like how Bob phrased this one. Go easy, go easy on the number of Ben radii. I'll let Bob yes. going. <laughs> well, every time you take a part and you have to put a bend in a part, you have to use a tool to do that. If you change the radii in a given part, 
and you have, let's say, 12 different bends, you may have to use 12 different tools to get the part to come out properly. But if when you're designing the part, you can design the part to use one internal bend radii, mm -hmm. then you can repeat that different tool set and not have to have different tools to form the part. What that means is less setup time on the equipment, less quality time to verify that the part is right, and through a throughput and better quality. So a lot of times we see design engineers that want to do this, but they don't. They want to change their bend radii and all the bends. Not a good thing. You always want to keep your internal bend radii the same whenever you can, and you always want to try to keep as many of the bends going the same way as you can. You don't want to be going up and down, back and mm -hmm. forth. Again, it's very costly to do that. So by just using a simple technique like this, you can save a lot of money, increase your throughput, and make better quality products. So, well, and less tooling would be involved too. Mm -hmm. So just by simply keeping the bend radii the same. Hey, so expand a little bit more on that. Actually, yeah. Bob's got a great point. For all the internal bends, yes, we can keep common bend radii. That's a great, it's great. It, it saves on setup time, saves on your manufacturing time. Mm -hmm. We do realize in certain certain circumstances there's cosmetic requirements. So like if we're talking self-checkout lanes, for instance, you want the front of your assembly to look nice. You want nice rounded corners, things that look like that. That's perfectly fine. Again, try and commonize so that on one side of a door, you don't have a three inch radius and then the other side you have a inch and a half. If that's what it has to be, that's what it has to be. But it's nice to try and commonize. It saves on setup time saves on overall manufacturing time, could potentially save cost as well. Yeah, and that's a big deal. That's a big deal, especially nowadays, right? Exactly. Absolutely it is. So number three, pretty piggybacks off the first one, but be sparing when it comes to rivets. And obviously when we talk about fasteners hardware, rivets are kind of their own, their own thing, right? There's some unique qualities to a rivet. What do we mean when we say go sparing on rivets? Well, you only use nice. a rivet in our yeah. industry where you really need to. Yeah. A rivet is a, is a self-aligning joint. So by putting two holes and two pieces, it does align itself properly to clinch it. But mm -hmm. you have to understand every time you do that, you have the cost of the rivet, plus you have the cost of assembling it, and you have the cost of doing it properly. So if you have a large enclosure with a whole bunch of rivets in it, it's great, but the problem is, is that are they gonna be all in the same place every time? Are you gonna be able to clinch them properly every time? Right. And are you not gonna forget one? So we always say use sparingly because a rivet is a single axis point of joining. It can be used, it has its, it has its purposes. But if you have double axis ways, there's other ways of improving the techniques, lesser cost, you haven't gotta buy the rivet, um, and better quality parts to do that. And, and, again, and when you look at rivet, into, yeah, Andy, you had some you had something to say as well. Go ahead. Yeah, that ties back into our original point where start if you don't know, start asking as far as are there other form features we can put into the part for those same fastened joints. Um, if it can be like in that first example I showed where it's an extruded hole rather than a rivet in the washer, that'll save time, still provides the joint that you're looking for, and you're not pounding on that reliability of the rivet or the extra assembly time to to accomplish the same thing in the end. Right, and if you wanna have a higher quality level, you have to think about this because all the rivets that are normally shot are manual. Mm -hmm. It's manual shooting, it'd be Andy and I with rivet guns putting it in. Yeah. It's a costly process, but it can be all very inconsistent. So you may wanna think of a technique like this, where this is a self clinching joint. Okay. What you do is it's similar to an extrusion, you take a male punch and a female die cavity and you clench the two parts together. Mm -hmm. A very strong joint. You don't have to add the cost of the rivet because you're just using the material you have there to create the clinch joint. A lot of things are put together like this. Office furniture is put together like this. Your washing machines and dryers, just flip them over. You'll see all the tidal joints in the bottom of them. Um, Weber grills are put together with this. You'll see things like that in industry. Sometimes they try to hide the joint, but it works very well. And the other good thing about this is it, it, it's, you don't have to have any heat. It's a cold form process. So you can join pre-coated materials. You can join stainless steel materials to cold roll materials. You can join different types of materials together. It's a yeah. very good process. So just use a simple punch and die them off. 
That's a great example. Now I can't flip over my washer and dryer, but I'm gonna have to take your word for that, Bob. <laughs> On number four, don't include impractical material requests. Andy's gonna right. start out with this one. Andy's, yeah, Andy's gonna kick this one off. <laughs> that one's kind of twofold, really. Um, when we say impractical material requests, what we like to try and see is harmonizing the material thickness. This really goes back to your setup time we talked about on your bend radii and things like that. If we've got to switch through as far as cutting steel between a piece of six gauge material to 12 gauge material to 14 gauge material back down to 10 gauge, there's a lot of setup time and a lot of actual manual handling of the, handling of the material there going back and forth. If we can look and see what we can do to commonize on that material thicknesses, that definitely helps run through things a lot a lot faster. Um, it also helps as far as using, we, so we don't end up a lot, with a lot of extra scrap material once we're done cutting out whatever the features are that are required by the design. Um, another thing, and Bob will kind of touch a little bit more on this, uh, the actual material itself. Mm -hmm. Take into consideration what's really needed. Um, we can handle anything from stainless steel to carbon steels to if you ask, we'll try it and we'll see what we can do anyways. <laughs> what you run into, especially when you start looking into your cosmetic situation, if you're gonna start looking at bright annealed stainless steel, you gotta be able to handle that without getting any tooling marks or scratches and stuff like that is gonna happen in a manufacturing environment. It takes time to go back and clean up that design when it's done so you get that mirrored like finish that you were hoping for in the beginning. If there's other things that we can implement as far as maybe a, paint, a painted surface as opposed to that stainless steel or if another material would suffice, something that might be easier to work with, mm -hmm. in the end it saves time and again, potential to save cost. Mm -hmm. yeah, awesome. Generally when you have a, a, a special material call out, usually there's like a 40,000 pound minimum draw from a mill or a service center and like 10 to 12 weeks lead time. So you got to really be careful when you do this stuff. Mm -hmm. Only use it when you need it, especially if you need to draw quality material. That can be more expensive and more lead time as well, but sometimes you have to have it. But only, only specify it when you need it. The other thing is the stainless that Andy talked about. Mm -hmm. A lot of times, in, pa in times past, everybody wanted to use 300 series stainless. Okay. Very good material, good for food grade. It was just thought to be the standard. Mm -hmm. But if you have a product like bumpers that go on some checkout lanes and stuff, they like the stainless, they like a grain stainless, but you don't need 300 series stainless, it's very costly. 400 series, which is a little iron in it, it's magnetic, mm -hmm. thick. that's good enough. All, all, all knives are made of 400 series stainless. They're not 300 series stainless, a lot of them, they're all 400 series stainless. Pocket knives, jack knives, they're all made of 400 series stainless. Mm -hmm. and they seem to work pretty good. So in the bumper situation, 400 series stainless is fine. Why pay for all that extra when you don't need it? Right. So always got to think about the material types. Right, that makes sense. That that expands on it because I was wondering what an impractical material request was. So so use it when you need it is what I'm hearing from this. And if not, try to find an easier way that'll help you uh, cut costs and speed up your timeline. And you can always ask us too. I mean, that's what we're here for. Yeah, we are. And like I said, leave questions in the comments. Let us know and we're monitoring. So um, we'll be answering some of those on our YouTube channel as well. Opt for powder coating, not wet paint. So why powder coating instead of wet paint? And again, we're talking enclosures, kiosks, cabinets, those types of things. Well, powder coating is very robust. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the outside products you see, lawn tractors, green enclosure that sit in a subdivision are all powder coated. Why? Mm -hmm. Powder coating is more friendly to the environment. Um, it's more, it's hard once it's gelled, it's very hard to get off. Um, and it's actually more cost effective by doing it like that because you, you can put it on much easier by using electrostatic powder coating. And it can be cleaned up easy with a vacuum cleaner. You put it in a drum, whatever the leftovers and you can just dispose of it. If you use wet powder, wet painting, mm -hmm. now you have a whole different thing you have to deal with. You can't yeah. clean it up and just throw it out. You have to have it recycled, reprocessed, more time consuming to put it on. And it's a lot more expensive and it's not clean for the environment. What goes up the stack is not real good. And then you have to have so many VOCs to actually do this stuff. Mm -hmm. So for wet, 
coating is normally used a lot in automotive painting businesses because they okay. can still do it, use a lesser amount. But when it comes to our business, you want to use powder coating. It's a much more durable process, more cost effective, and it really gives you a nice finish, whether it's a wrinkle finish or it's a gloss finish. It can, you can do it either way. You can do the same things as, as wet painting. So and that's why we you, recommend yeah. powder coating. And what about custom colors and things like that? I know we get a lot of questions on, you know, when we do things that go into brands or matching brands, you know, powder coating has that type of versatility as well. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, a number of our painting suppliers have actual charts that use established colors. Mm -hmm. So first we try to have a customer try to use one of the established colors. Mm -hmm. That's already by a company. Right. That's the easiest. If it isn't, then we can go to that as long as we have the color chip you want. We can send it to our suppliers and it can create a color for you. Okay. The first go is always a little more because they have to get it matched and approved. Mm -hmm. but then after that, powder coating is readily available within three or four weeks to get it and to be processed more from that on. So you normally know, can paint everything in powder coating. You could paint a liquid. It's okay. just that sometimes you have to have the first color established to do that. Yeah, we definitely see that a lot in designs. Sometimes a customer comes to us and knows exactly what color they want. So they'll send us, hey, it's this specification. Here's the details. See what you can do for a color match. Mm -hmm. um, I've actually seen it where we've gotten specific samples of a small piece of steel that actually has the color on it saying, hey, we want this. Mm -hmm. um, to the other end of that spectrum, we also have customers who go, well, I wanted a white, but I'm not really sure what finish of a white. We can go through and either paints that we have in-house or from our supplier, we can get small samples and get those too. So you can take a look and hold it, feel it, see what it actually looks like on the material and then make a decision based off of that. Got it. Got it. That's pretty nice. That's pretty nice that they can take it in-house and look at it and see if it's exactly what they want. Because we do pretty large quantities, especially too. So you don't want to figure that out after production. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> All right, moving on to the next one, minimizing masking points. I had to think about that one before I said it, minimizing masking points. <laughs> so who wants um, to take this one? Normally, I'll start out and then you can dig in here. Normally, oh, masking points are normally what you do is you try to mask any threaded holes. Um, here's a case in point, whether it be a hem fastener hardware yeah. or a threaded hole, the normal procedure would be to put a plug mask, a silicone mask in there, um, which is kind of standard practices. But you have to understand, every time that mask has got to be put on, a human being puts that mask on and takes the mask off. Okay. So it does take some time and consistency to do it, especially if you have some products we have have 100 and some masking points. Mm -hmm. Time consuming, it's always a chance for a failure. So what we say is look at your masking points, make sure you really need the point mask, and if there's a different way of doing it, uh, let's say in a tap hole, for instance, you can put a little larger thread in there, mm -hmm. same size, but larger thread, then maybe the powder doesn't build up as much and you don't need to mask it. Then you use a screw, a thread forming screw that goes in there and just locks it in. So you try to do techniques like that, to try to help yourself to minimize these points. A lot of other areas we see masking situations is uh, because of the fact that we do a lot of electrical enclosures, um, grounding locations. Okay. When you want to go and ground out your electrical components inside the cabinet or ground the cabinet itself, you need a bare metal surface there. There are okay. other opportunities rather than just having a hole with a certain area that's masked off by paint. Um, you can actually put collar studs that are welded right to it. And the actual collar of the stud is where it's grounded to. The weld then carries the ground through to the extra material of the cabinet. Um, it's situations like that where it makes it a lot easier on us. Like, like Bob said, every time you want to go and apply a mask to something, that's a manual process. Somebody physically has to go down and put those silicone plugs in or put a piece of tape over in the designated area. We realize that does still come up. That does still need to happen in certain situations. We try mm -hmm. and make it easier on ourselves as far as manufacturing abilities go by perhaps doing a laser etch in the material to outline the area that needs to be grounded, whether mm -hmm. it's a one inch diameter circle around a, around a hole, or we see a lot of squared out patterns where they've got a grounding pad that goes in there. Um, it's still, it's still possible. There's still possibilities. There's still a reason for it, um, but where we can suggest alternatives, we'll see what we can do to help, help you out. 
Awesome. And is there an aesthetic plate to masking points to keep in mind? When you're looking at masking points on an enclosure, is it something you're going to see? On typically, that enclosure? When, typically, these are interior points inside a cabinet. Got it. Like I said, a lot of times it's for grounding situations is where we see it most. Got it. No, Got it. I'm telling you, I learned, I learned something new every day from you two. Every day. <laughs> so the last one we have is, and this is something that maybe people don't have top of mind when they're looking at the design, but see the big picture when it comes to packaging costs. Yeah. What people don't understand is, first off, if you have a packaging is going to cost money to do it either way you want to do it. Mm -hmm. So the old conventional way is we'll put all on corrugated boxes. Well, you can do that, but 10 to 1, your enclosures are all different sizes. So if you have to design a special box for everything, that's more lead time, more cutting die costs, and more, more expense. But if you have a, a customer that is able to use returnable pack, let's say a wood crate, or a different type of container, a plastic container, Mm -hmm. They can put these parts in every time you can ship them back and forth. Mm -hmm. It's not only greener for your environment, you save cost because now you haven't got to take all that packaging down, ship it back, chances of getting damaged it, and he hasn't got to dispose of it all because it just gets returned back and forth. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you look at other companies that ship stuff, they have all these boxes going all over the place. Now, the companies that make these boxes are happy because they're making boxes. But if you think of the whole picture, some of that stuff may be able to be avoided because of the fact that you could use returnable packaging mm -hmm. or standardized boxes. A lot of times, you, if you don't have to have special sizes, people will see something in a bigger box. Well, the reason they're doing it is because they're trying to standardize and having instead of 25 different boxes, maybe they have 12 different boxes, put some dunnage and stuff and ship it that way. But packaging is, is usually a bigger cost. And the way you want to attack it is look at what the part is used for first. If it's a cosmetic panel, Make sure you package it the right way. You got to protect the surfaces. And if you can do it, use a returnable pack. It makes more sense if your company can handle back and forth. It's a, it's a much better solution for all of us. If you can't, then try to standardize on some kind of a package that's readily available. Not having special cutting die costs and stuff to make a special size box. To help yourself out a little bit. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Something to definitely keep top of mind, huh? Absolutely. Andy, anything you want to add to that? Yeah, packaging seems to be one of those things that tends to get overlooked, really, to be, to be quite honest. Um, we get all the cosmetic requirements, we get the manufacturing requirements, and then it gets to the end and we're ready to put it on a truck and ship it to the customer, and it goes, oh wait, now what do we do? Right. Um, especially when it comes to the cosmetics and sheer quantities. How many are we making for, or how many of these products are we making and how many are we shipping out? Um, when we can, it helps to go to that returnable shipping situation. If it's in larger quantities, and the cosmetic situation is also more protected in there, because we're going to specifically design something around that product and not just cardboard corners and stretch wrap it around and maybe burn and maybe bolt it to a pallet. Um, we do our best to make sure things are protected as far as shipping goes. If you are going to be shipping a couple thousand of these. It's a lot easier on everybody, and it helps out a lot if we've got something specifically based off of what it is that we're shipping. Awesome. Awesome. You know, because the, the worst thing you can do is make a high-quality product and ship it to a customer, and once the customer gets it, mm -hmm. it's uh, defective before it even opens it up because of the packaging. Nobody yeah. wants that. No, no, no one wants that. No one wants that. I've been in that in before, and it's not a pleasant experience. Right. So right. you always want to have it packaged adequately. And the other thing, more than one thing has happened, if you have a preferred carrier or something to ship it on, mm -hmm. let us know that up front so we know who to ship it. There's yeah. been a number of times that you get ready to ship something and you don't know the carrier. Well, yeah. the customer's taking care of the carrier. Well, who is the carrier? So we know how to, how to process it and ship it properly. So yeah. when the order is entered, if you have a preferred carrier, you should you know, state that on the order so we know what's going to use. Yeah, you know what, these are all good points when someone's also looking to qualify who am I going to use for my sheet metal fabricator or my contract manufacturing partner. These are things to ask, to look at. The great thing is I'm going to actually put a link 
on the bottom of where you're seeing this video so you can easily access the blog. I know we talk fast. Um, these two really know their stuff and they could probably talk a lot longer on this as well. But this is a pretty quick sneak peek. The one biggest piece of advice I'd say is you don't know if you don't ask. We're the sheet metal experts as far as it goes. We can provide ulterior situations for manufacturing, uh, assembly, things like that. Um, work, we're, we're, we're looking to work with you. Bring your design to us. We'll take a look through things. We'll provide suggestions. We'll see what we can do to make sense for us and make sense for you. Awesome. And Bob? Yes, Andy brings up a good point. We are here to help you. If you have something you want to ask, the only dumb question is the one you don't ask. So if you have a question, please ask the question and we'll give you assistance whenever we can to help you out with your design. Make it a successful enclosure design for you. Awesome. Well, I, I would say that was a success for our first ever video that we're doing here at our Allenton uh, in this type of virtual format. So thanks, Andy, and thanks, Bob. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Andy. Thanks, thanks, guys. Andy. Thanks.